Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air global network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author, Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Lori Brand. Lori is a lifting enthusiast, group fitness instructor, yoga teacher, and software quality engineer. Mm -hmm. In past lives, she's been a gymnast, dancer, playboy model, and bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. Her time in the body wars trenches led her to realization that getting strong rather than shrinking is the way out. In an effort to spread the word, she's had articles published in Strong Fitness Magazine, T Nation, Inside Fitness Magazine, Define Fitness Magazine, and more. Bodies to Die For is her first novel. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. So I, I, I really enjoyed your book. I read from it um, earlier today on my Mon uh, quote of the week, Mondays. I actually did it on a Monday okay. this week. I don't always do that. Um, okay. Before we get into all the incredible stuff about women's bodies and cl diet mm -hmm. culture, can you tell our listeners a little bit about Bodies to Die For? Sure. So it's a thriller. And the tagline is the body image war is moving offline and fit girls are dying. And it revolves around two main characters. There is Gemma, who is a IFBD bikini bodybuilding pro. And there is Ashley, who is a overweight. We actually say that she's fat and frustrated. She's a software engineer. And it's their clash online and how that clash online moves offline. And so it's the, the fat activists versus the fitness influencers, wellness culture, and how the whole thing spirals out of control. It climaxes at the Olympia, which is like the biggest bodybuilding competition in the world. And at its core though, it is, um, it's about the war on women's bodies, the wars we wage on each other and the wars that we wage on ourselves. It also takes a hard look at social media in the $70 billion yes. industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this because as you said, there's a ton to unpack here. And actually one of the things I think is so, it's, it's a hard thing to, to talk about, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we all, every woman, every person should feel yeah. comfortable in their body. And mm -hmm. yet, of course, I don't even know how many of us actually do, but right. it takes, I mean, I'm 53. I had to think mm -hmm. about how old I am. And I mm -hmm. finally, 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 I'm like, okay, I'm, I am good. And mm -hmm. I think, but my twenties, my thirties, even my forties, yeah, it, it was just such a struggle. Like, you know, and, and, and there's so much put on us as women. Yep. So talk to us about sort of like, you know, how, I mean, first of all, what is your sort of sense of what, you know, what, what is the sort of way to look at all of this and what are we doing wrong? That's a big question, Lori. What are we so doing I wrong? Think, okay, so I think, well, I think there's two things, okay? I think I think one of them is that we're all judging each other, right? And I yeah. think, um, and I, I really think that we have to stop judging each other. We, we have to, and not just judging each other, but judging ourselves, right? Give, give, yeah. give each other and ourselves some grace. So that, that would be like a big step in the right direction. And, and then the other thing is we're, we're so often placing our self-worth on these external beauty standards. And external beauty standards shift, right? They, they're, they're always changing. Everybody's got something that's a little bit different. You'll, you'll never please everybody. So if you're always looking for that external validation, you're always going to find yourself, I think, wanting or lacking. And so like by the time that you get to the end of my, my book, um, you know, it brings up about how, you know, wanting to be strong, because if, if you set your goal on yeah. getting strong versus yeah. shrinking, it's a, it's a growth mentality. And, um, you know, it's, it's not what you can't eat. So you shrink It's what you need It's what you eat to nourish your body. And also if you set your goal and say, I want to do a push up, I want to do a pull up. I want to squat a hundred pounds. I want to walk to the end of the block and back, whatever it is, whatever strong is for you, you can set yourself a goal, an attainable goal, and you can do that. And it's very yeah. empowering. And once you start setting these, these goals for yourself and you start to just tick them off and you, then you increase your goal and you increase your goal, you'll find that you just become incredibly not just physically strong, but mentally yes. strong. It's a big, big, big mind shift. And that's really, so I wrote the book. <laughs> so anyway. I actually, I love yeah. that idea of like yeah. not shrinking. Cause I think a lot of us uh -huh. are like, I want to weigh X mm -hmm. number of pounds yeah. or I want to yeah. fit yeah, into yeah. that size, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But I love that idea that, right. What we really want, I think is to just, 
is to feel strong. And I think women in particular, right? Because Mm -hmm. we're not the physically stronger Mm -hmm. sex always, you know? Um, And because I think society has this idea that we're not really supposed to be strong or Mm -hmm. some of us are saying some, now we're sort of saying women should be strong, but then there's still Uh people saying women shouldn't be strong. Women should be secondary. There's this Mm -hmm. so many mixed messages and particularly for our young women, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. what do we tell them? You know, we just want but the idea that you can do that, that you can set a goal and accomplish yeah. it. I, I, I think when we were talking about young women, I would say even, even our, our daughters, right. And even, yeah. even young girls. And I think, um, I think it's really important to model if, if you're a parent or, or even if you've got some kind of, um, you, even if you're an aunt or you've got, you know, younger daughters or younger girls in your life that you model a strong woman right? That, yeah. that you model, you model good eating behaviors. When I say good, I mean, like, you don't, you know, you don't say to yourself, you don't say out loud, you know, oh, I shouldn't be eating that. Or, oh, this is so terrible. Oh, I, I'm so awful for eating this because, you know, the little ears are, are watching, are, yeah. are listening. Right. And, yeah. um, and, and that, you know, your, your daughters or young girls see, see their, their parents or other women in their life, exercising, being strong, doing hard things, you know, maybe you do obstacle course training. I don't know what, what, whatever, whatever you find empowering, but, but they, right. they see you enjoying your body, using your body to do cool things rather right. than just, rather than just as something for somebody to like admire. Right. Right. You're, you're going to use your body. You're going to do something with it. You know, I'm going to go, um, you know, run a 5k or what, what, whatever, whatever appeals to you. you right. Know? Yeah, yeah and I, exactly. And I think living inside of those you know, the, the, well, living inside those bodies and feeling like uh-huh. the really the purpose of the body is to get you to where you want to go to, to yeah. enable you to do the things. And if we're able bodied, right, yeah, we can walk, or, you know, down the beach or mm-hmm. bike, ride a bike down the beach or, yeah. you know, take a vacation and walk through the streets of a new city. Then yeah. that is really should be our goal. But it is yeah. hard. I mean, and let, let's talk about social media, because I yeah. think this is it's a it's a real problem and I noticed I mean my daughter's 24 so she's right uh-huh. in the thick of yeah. that you know self-judgment others judgment um yeah. that, that it's out there where where's the like positivity where's the sort of like it's out I know there are sites that sort of that do it I, but yeah so I think I think also you have to look at at, at yourself right like how how you are consuming social media you know yeah. if, if if um so like you know, I follow I tend to follow a lot of girls exercising like I, I really like Olympic weight weightlifting right and so I uh-huh. follow a lot of girls snatching right and um, I find it empowering I find it like inspirational I'd be like oh my god that's like so cool right so if, if I if I get that kind of feeling that's a good thing but there might be other people who if, if there are certain sites like if you're somebody say who is recovering from maybe an eating disorder it might not be good for you to follow like say before and after sites or diet sites or, or whatever the, you might you might find that triggering and so yeah. I, I think I think I think we have some responsibility to ourselves what we what we choose to follow right yeah um you know and, and being honest with yourself and saying you know that th- this isn't good for my mental health or maybe it's not good for my mental health right now right. um and and just being a, a consumer of that also I think um not <laughs> not engaging with the crazy, you know, like, like when things start to blow up on social media, maybe you just, you know, take a step away and, and, yeah. and not engage with that because, right. oh my. Yeah. 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 It gets, it does. It gets super, <laughs> super crazy. Yeah. Well, there's also oh, this yeah. fat shaming thing, which is, mm-hmm. you know, and actually, you know, it's interesting about sort of the, the correspondence between eat, like food is the single trickiest addiction, right? Yeah, because it is. You can't give it up. Right. Totally. I mean, right. Yep. Yep. Um, and yet, you know, and so many people are like, I, you know, I love, I don't know if you've read Roxanne Gay, but she do, writes no. beautifully okay. about, you know, she went through trauma. She was gang raped and, mm-hmm. and she started to eat uh-huh. as a way to sort of like make her body into something to feel protected. And yeah. I think some of it, some of it was the idea that if she was a certain, if she looked a certain way, no one would ever hurt her that way again. Yeah. And some yeah, of it yeah. was like to kind of become invisible because of that pain. Yeah. And she didn't share that pain with her family. She couldn't at that time. Uh-huh. And it's, I mean, I think that's a thing too. We have to just sort of like, you know, there is this there, eating and, and trauma and stress and depression and yeah. they're all so wound together. And yet, you know, you can't just be like, okay, I'm going to show up at my AA meeting and just stop cold turkey eating. It does not work that way. 
Yeah, I, I, I want to piggyback on that. So on on um we on the Saturdays, I volunteer as a yoga teacher at a homeless shelter for women and children, and Amazing. we will very very frequently we will see um it's it's uh like when I say transitional housing, they'll frequently stay for say like six months. You know, like they yeah. they come in, they stay there, they kind of get on their feet and they leave. Um, but we will very often see people gain some weight. You know, because they they maybe are coming here because they just quit doing drugs or they had a drinking yeah. problem or they, or they left somebody who like a guy who was very controlling of them or who was maybe pot potentially physically abusive or whatever. And, and you know, they're making all these strides in, um, in, in their lives. But sometimes you'll, you'll, the, you know, they'll, they'll say like, you know, that they, they feel so awful, but what they look like, but you know, Hey, you just, you just quit meth. Okay. Like, yeah, you right. know, I mean, that, I mean, so, so sometimes, you know, we just have to really give ourselves that grace and, and yeah. it's so hard to know. And you really can't know, right. For, for each individual person, you don't know what, what that is, what, 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 food or whatever is serving for them right now. And that that's right. really one of the reasons why I really would like to see us quit, quit shaming each other, quit talking. Like I refuse, I will not buy. If I ever see like on the cover of a magazine where it says like, so-and-so got fat, like with the actress on it, you know, oh, like, yeah. so -so, or, or, or if it shows like, like a woman with like a, like a, one of those rectangles over her eyes, you know, like she's a fashion no, cause she's like bubbling out of her clothes or whatever. Like don't, don't buy stuff like that. Just refuse yeah. to buy it. Right. Um, but I yeah, we just, we just have to give each other that, that grace and that kindness. You can be anything in the world. Be, be kind, you know? Oh, I think that's right. I think that's, yeah. and in particularly women, I mean, yeah. the men walk down, you know, nobody pays attention to them, but no. and also aging. I mean, I, there's yep. so many yep. wonderful, um, you know, I mean, like Jamie Lee Curtis is such a fabulous mm -hmm. voice on aging because she will show yeah. you, you know, she will come out without makeup on. She will say, this yeah. is what we look like. Yeah. And it is true because, you know, it, it, it gets, and maybe that's one of the reasons why I find it easier the older mm -hmm. I get, because you're just mm -hmm. like, hey. There's not, you know, I'm not going to be 20 anymore. Right. I'm not going to have a 20 year old body. I'm not going to have a 20 year old face. And mm -hmm. I'm now going to sort of just do what feels good to me. But I do wish there was a way to sort of inspire people to do that and, and to inspire them to, to, like you said, to sort of look at their neighbor and, and say, instead of, you know, wow, she does look like she's put on some weight or hasn't slept in a month or whatever, oh. to be like, you know, hey, is there anything I can do to help? Yeah. You know? It yeah. seems like maybe, you know, you're having, a tough time because clearly when there are signs, especially on, you know, on all of us, when things mm -hmm. are not going super well. So yeah. can you talk to us, well, let's get back to the book because we can talk okay. about women's oh, sure. issues okay. forever. Okay. Um, okay. But I appreciate that. I mean, I think there's a lot to unpack and, you know, I, I, I don't even know where to start other than to say, I love the idea that we should be kind to one another mm -hmm. and, you know, and men sort of, sometimes I think they pit us against each other. Uh, yeah. sort of, or the patriarch system put pits us against each other. So mm -hmm. we should be really nice to each other, um, extra nice so that we can, you know, say, fuck the man. Pardon me, okay. my French. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about, um, there's some, you know, can you talk to us about, this is your first book. So it is. Whole, the, I know, which is uh, so interesting in itself. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about sort of how you wrote it mm -hmm. um, and sort of the process it went through before, you know, between, I know you drew, you kind of drew the cover. You showed I me. Did. That I did. I did. Yeah. That was so fun. You kind of had yeah. an idea of what you wanted it to look, look like. So tell us sort of the process. What was it like? How long did it take? Okay. Well, so I'll, let me tell you first, I was actually writing a different book when, when inspiration for this pinged, I was maybe like 20, 30,000 words into another book. And then it was in, in January of 2020, uh, Jillian Michaels was interviewed on BuzzFeed News, and she was asked what she thought about Lizzo as a body acceptance role model. And she said, why, why are we talking about her body? Why, why aren't we celebrating her music? Because it's not going to be great if she gets diabetes. I don't know if you remember, but social media completely blew up, right? And it really, uh -huh. captured, it really captured my attention. And then a few months after that, Adele um, posted a picture of herself to Instagram, and it was clear that she had lost a lot of weight. And people came out of the woodwork and some, some were saying that they were disappointed that she, um, that they were disappointed in her because they viewed her as a role model. And other people were saying they thought it was great that, that she had lost this weight. And then she came out uh, a little bit later with a statement about it because there was just so much controversy where she said that um, she'd been going through a dark time and she turned to exercise to help her deal with it. But the thing is that Adele shouldn't have to make a statement, right? Because no. she doesn't owe any of us her body. 
but so it was it was this this thing that happened in like the spring of 2020 that just it just captured my imagination mm -hmm. i just i just couldn't let go of like you have these two sides clashing and what if this moved offline i just couldn't shake it and so finally i i told myself you know what i'm going to set this other book aside i'm going to i'm just going to write for like one day i'm going to see where it takes me and i like kicked out like 5000 words and then I was yeah. like, you know what? Okay, I'm 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 saying the other book. I'm I'm like running with this. And so then I I wrote that book, this book. I want to say the first draft didn't take me that long because I just like, it, well, but maybe not compared to you. But for me, it took it took me like three or four months, I think, to get a to get a draft. I don't because write a first I was, draft in I, three or four months. I don't That's know, bad. like, like that, but I, so, so I just I just I like I blew through it because I like I like really like. I just, I don't know, like I was just captured by this, right? But that was a first draft and it needed yeah. a lot of work. So I finished the first draft and, you know, I had written another book, I want to say 10 years ago. And I had, I had queried it. I got some offers or not offers. I got some, um, some uh, requests for fulls, partials and fulls, but I never got uh, an agent. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize from the feedback I was getting from that first manuscript that, uh, I was going to need a significant rewrite. And I didn't really feel like putting in the work. It was almost like that first book I had to write for me. Yeah. Whereas, this, whereas, whereas this book, this book I had to write like for the world because I had something to say, right? Yeah. And so, and so because of I had already lived that first one, I was more cautious this time, right? I was like, yeah. all right, just because you're done, don't go like querying people, right? Yeah, and so you I, might not be done then, right? Yeah, right. and so I, so I set it aside. I took, I look, I don't know, maybe for like a few weeks. Then I rewrote it, rewrote it some more. I got it as absolutely tight as I thought I could possibly get it. Then I went and I got some um, beta readers on Good Goodreads. I think I had you know, sent it to them, got feedback from them. Then I I got I did three beta readers, and if one person said something, and if it resonated, it changed it. If it didn't resonate, I might not have. But if two said something and it didn't resonate, mm -hmm. I still thought about it really hard. And if all three yeah. said the same thing, it didn't resonate, I fixed it anyway. And so I did I did all that. Then I then I queried it. And I initially only queried women because I thought only only women are going to care about this, right? That's not a guy thing. But then, um, but there was one agent who I really respected, right? I really respect Shane Salerno. I've always just really liked that guy, right? And so I finally thought to myself, well, you know, you, know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Yeah. And so I so I, I I queried him on a and I, he's not my agent, but um, but I queried him on a Saturday night at like ten o'clock because I I have no life, right? <laughs> and, and he got he got and, and so I wake up at two in the morning. And what do you do? Well, you might, uh, you, you've been published for so long, you might not remember, but what do I do? I check my phone to see if anybody has responded to any of my emails at two oh, in the morning. I have, I have uh, been doing that every year. Okay. For, yeah. Okay. So I, ch I, ch yeah. I, ch I check, I check my email at two in the morning, but oh my God, he responded. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm not taking new clients right now, but, um, but this, this sounds promising. So I'm, I'm seeing a younger agent who, who I, I think could potentially be a good fit if you want to, if you want to check him out. And I was like, whoa. And so, um, and then he even responded like 30 minutes later, he wrote back again and said it. And, and one more thing, I think if you could get the tone right, you could have something here. He was thinking subversive. So I wrote the word subversive on a post-it note. And I stuck it um, on my vanity in my bathroom. And then I contacted that other agent, Jackson mm -hmm. Keeler, who's a guy. And, you know, Jackson read my manuscript and he signed me. And then when he took it out, so and then Jackson and I, we, he's a very developmental agent. And so yeah. he and I, and so when he signed me, this is just crazy. He and I are talking and he's saying like, okay, well, I think, you know, in the second act, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about the second act? I know. He's I like, know. he's like, you know, the second, and he's like, well, I said, well, how many acts are there? And he said, there, there, there's three. And so <laughs> I got off, I got off the phone with him and I, and I Googled, um, three act story structure. And Danielle, I was blown away. I was like, get out. There's an actual, like, <laughs> like this could have helped me enormously. Had I known that, man? Oh my God. But I, you know, I, I read so many thrillers that I, I kind of inherently. Um, yeah, you knew it. Like I, I still don't, yeah. I, 
Yeah. I still work very much by feel. So yeah. um, I don't know that. Yeah. But you've heard enough stories. You've read enough stories to know yeah. what, the, what the sort of sensation yeah. is of those. But yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. So, so, so that he and I rewrote it. We made it. He, he just really helped me clean that up. I, I'm really thankful to him. And then he took it out and we initially also, so we took it to all women editors except for one who was a guy that that Jackson knew and we sold it to the guy yeah so, that's great. Um, so you, you just never you just never know so yeah. don't discount men yeah I love that that's uh, a yeah. great message yeah and that's true yeah. I mean men you know the, actually this isn't just a female phenomenon right I mean mm-hmm. it absolutely happens to men men are self-conscious about how they look um you know men are fat shamed too it just happens yeah. more to women and it's like you know, the beauty industry, the fashion industry, it's sort yeah. of more point. But I bet you there are male models who feel the pressure to keep the weight off and be yeah. skinny and, you know, aspiring, you know, actors and whoever. But yeah, so I think that's totally fair. And I love that. That's a really yeah. good, because I think, you know, we can't assume that's no. a problem, right? Yeah. We can't and assume. you know where, where I got really lucky, and this is, this is just straight up, this is straight up luck, is that um, I think one of the reasons why, why Blackstone bought it, so, so Daniel had liked it, Daniel um, Aaron Haft, but he gave it to some other people at, at Blackstone to read. And it just so happens that one of the women in, women in marketing, Brie, uh, she is a female bodybuilder. Oh, and there you go. she was like, oh my God, we have to be Daniel by this book. And so, um, so that, that, that did help. Yeah. I, I, at least I think, I don't know, but yeah. Well, I mean, it needs, yeah. I mean, every book needs a little spark of magic and yeah, a lot of yeah. sort of solid, you know, a solid work behind it. And I haven't yeah. read a book in the bodybuilding world and I know you are. So tell us about your own, cause it sounds okay. like, you know, you've done a lot of, um, this kind of work. I go to the, I'm like a, I never went to the gym until about okay. 10 years ago. I started going and I uh-huh. actually go to sort of a CrossFit gym and I uh-huh. love it. Yeah. Um, we don't call it CrossFit anymore, I guess, because oh. of that guy, but, um, oh, okay. but it's, yeah, but it's, you know, it's that style and mm-hmm. I never thought I'd be a gym person, mm-hmm. but I, I just, I love it when somebody's telling me exactly what to do. Okay. Um, so yeah. talk to us about how you got into that and, and how, what do I got you do in, now? how I got into bodybuilding. So, okay. So I'll tell you how I got into bodybuilding. So, so I have been pretty much athletic for, for most of my life, but then when my, so I've got three kids, but my, my second and my third are, are twins. And after they were born, when they were, so my, my oldest was like two, when my two and a half of my twins were born. And, um, I still exercised until my twins were a year old. Then I had a tummy tuck and the recovery was brutal and I just kind of fell out of it. Right. I did, I did exercise for maybe, maybe six years and I I did, I didn't gain any weight or anything, but the interesting thing is something in my mind kind of changed. Right. I just, I, I felt like I was becoming like like mentally weaker, you know, I just, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, I just, I wasn't as happy as I used to be. I just wasn't, I just, I don't know. I, and I started to feel like I just got walked over all the time. And then my kids all were in school and I almost like went through like a midlife crisis, right? Like I, all of a sudden I had like my days free and I, I cause I'd, I'd been a stay at home mom. Um, and like, what am I going to do with my life? And, um, and so I really started lifting weights then just because I, I, I actually wanted to get strong. I just felt like I was, I just, I was depressed and I felt like I wanted to get strong and it was lifting weights then, which was a completely different, you know, from in my, in my twenties where I was really focused on what I looked like, right. I was always, always about the package. Right. So then I started, I started lifting weights with this goal of getting strong. And that's really what changed for me mentally. And, you know, that, that's then when I started, um, you know, writing for fitness magazines and things, but I got into bodybuilding because I just really then got into lifting weights like big time, but because I was, um, lifting weights with this new mentality, right. That's when I was trying to really notice how many women with these great bodies were seeing so many flaws in themselves, but so, so that, that, that's really what I got into bodybuilding and I, I stayed with it for a number of years. And then I finally, eventually I just kind of got like, you know, it's, it's, very much about your package. It's what you bring to this. You even call it your package, like the package that you bring to the stage. And I, I instead kind of got to the point where like, I, I didn't really, I wasn't so interested in what my body looked like, but I wanted to like do cool things with it. Yeah, so then, yeah. then, then I got, so then I, I kind of walked away from bodybuilding. I got into Olympic lifting for a while. Um, 
obstacle course training because uh, I kind of hurt my shoulder with Olympic lifting. But um, I've just I've just kind of been in this this um fitness space uh, ever since because I just I just I just love it. Right, it makes me feel really really good. It, it's like a, a uplifting thing. So um, so yeah, I, I, mean, I uh, do a lot. Yeah, the endorphins are real. I mean, yeah, I think the endorphins absolutely. are real. I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, and you can't, I don't know that you get them from anything quite like the way you do when you sort of exert yourself in sweat. Um, mm -hmm. And I have just, so, you know, I have just discovered these, but I haven't done one, but I wonder mm -hmm. if you have done one or know mm -hmm. them, the Spartan races. So I, I've, done, I've done a few mud races. Um, or, okay. I, right, right. So I've, I've done a few of those. Um, I think one of them might've been a Spartan one. I can't remember. Um, I've done like maybe three of them you know tell, um, tell okay. our listeners what they are because they're kind okay. of like they're very they're sort of like the last thing my like they're the most unfeminine fabulous yeah. thing that, yeah I, that I think you could do tell us okay what so are. so they're like they're like these like so the last one I did was I think called the tough mutter and so they're in the middle of nowhere first of all there's like a field somewhere that somebody must pay a farmer off to use or something and they have obstacle course they'll have an obstacle course there but then they'll also It'll be like, you'll like run for a mile. Then like, you'll like wade through like marshy, muddy water. You'll like crawl underneath weird stuff. You'll scale some walls. You like go across like monkey bars. You'll have to like carry like, you know, something heavy. Um, they just have right. all these various things that you'll, it's like obstacle course spliced with like running somehow. And somehow yeah. you become really dirty and muddy at the end of it. <laughs> um, after, after the last one I did, I, um, I actually got so much I somehow I ended up with mud in my ear, like seriously mud in my ear and it got compacted in there and I had to go to the doctor and get it like, like removed because <laughs> and like all this junk came out of my ear, but um, it's, so, it's it, really fun. You it know? sounds fun. It's like, it is very it's fun. like when we're kids and playing the mud, you know, and it's, yeah. there's also this, and it's, I think the ones that I have seen are like kind of mm -hmm. team sports. So it's like a yes. group of you, you're all trying to like yep. get stuff done and win for the, and, you know, and it's a little bit like those, you know, there's the reality shows that yeah. are on TV, the amazing race or whatever they are. But okay. for me, it's just like the idea of being part of a team where you're, yep. you know, and you end up falling in the mud and that's super fun yep. and funny. And so I want to yeah. do what it's on my, but not the big one. There's like a big Spartan and then there's like littler ones. And I still, a lot of them still mean you have to like run eight miles and I don't want to run eight miles. So, so what, what I would suggest for anybody listening is, um, wear a pair of tennis shoes. You're never going to use again. Yeah. Like, like you're going to throw them away. Whatever you wear that day, like anything that you bring or you wear, just figure yeah. it's, it's, it's done because it's yeah. just going to be filthy when you're done with it. Yeah. At least the tennis shoes. Yeah. Something about that, that is just so appealing to me. And I wonder what that is. That's the part of me probably that was never supposed to get muddy as a kid, but I, okay. um, but I do, I love that idea. And I, I, there is something about, there's also something about the, the friendships you make in the gym, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both male and female friendships that I find really, because you are kind of, you know, I mean, at least in the right gym, I think gyms uh -huh. can be a hotbed of, you know, co competition yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. But in the right gym, you're, you know, and on the days when you can't do anything and you're barely, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, there's always people going, okay, you got this. And then on the yeah. days when you're feeling really good, you know, it's, um, it's a, it's a very positive experience. I think, I think usually it, it is. And, and, you know, one thing that my book might not quite portray because it's a thriller, right. But, um, bodybuilders are some of the nicest people you'll ever oh, meet. I'm sure. I, I had to, I had to, I had to make, I had to make some of them kind of like catty in my book just because otherwise it's not a book, right. I need, it's a thriller. Somebody's got to die. Well, there, things, but, you know, I really yeah. appreciated the, there was one woman who was brand new from Kentucky. I'm going to forget yes, her name. Kentucky crystal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Crystal. Right. Uh -huh. And I just thought there was that moment when you kind of got the idea of what and how Gemma treated her and what uh -huh. that would have been like versus the other, mm -hmm. you know, not as mm -hmm. nice, but I, I think there's that, of course you get the idea and that's mm -hmm. the true of everything. Right. I mean, yeah. Right. You came to your first thriller fest. Was that your first yes. thriller fest? It was my second one. My second, second. one. I went, I went last year. Mm -hmm. It's very right, fun and, though. Right. And writers can seem so intimidating and scary. Yes. And yes. yet they're also right. The thriller writers are so nice. I've heard that romance <laughs> writers might not necessarily be. I don't know if that's true or not, but the the people at Thriller Fest are so are so lovely. Um, you know, like I, I haven't anybody who I ever introduced myself to, you know, who if I if I came up to them and said, you know, 
oh, you know, I, I love this book of yours that you wrote. Um, they, everybody was just more than happy to talk to you. And, um, yeah. you know, they're, everybody's very down to earth, very real. And then also you get to, uh, another good thing about Thriller Fest is you get to hear these different famous authors talk who are really at the top of, you know, the, the top of their game. And yeah. a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll talk about what it took to get there yeah. that not everybody's aware of, you know, like the, the, the failed manuscripts, the, the books that got canceled, the books that, uh, you know, that I got turned down and, um, you know, like where they, you know, sold three, four books and they had a lot of success and all of a sudden nobody wanted the fifth or their agent yeah, dropped. I I mean, you hear about these things and, and you go, but you know, they're, they're still here. Look at them now. Yeah. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, if nothing else, just to hear that resilience, you know, if you want to stay in the game, it's, it sounds like it's resilience. You know? It is resilient. It's, oh. and it's, it's being open to learning forever. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's being open yeah. to when somebody says something about your book, even if it's not what you want to hear, it's yeah. being open to sort of, yeah. you know, listening and, um, and continuing to strive to get better, I think. Yeah. So, and it sounds yeah. like you did that. I mean, I think one of the things that we see with a lot of first time, um, you know, novelists, and it's true, certainly uh -huh. true of actually my first three books um, uh -huh. are permanently buried. But um, <laughs> I think it's the idea that you just, you finish it and you're like, I'm done. Yeah. And so um, I'm about to go actually on submission with a book that uh -huh. I've been working on really for like, I've written books in between, but this book uh -huh. I've been working on for like three years. And okay. I know it's not done yet. I mean, I okay. think it's pretty damn good, but yeah. obviously if it sells, an editor will, you know, will do something more with it. So I have to be yeah. open to the idea that yeah. it's not done until, you know, right. until it's done. So, yeah. yeah, and you have to love an idea enough to really live with it for a long time. Very much, very much. Um, that that's one thing that I, I can't get over is how slow publishing is, right? <laughs> yeah. I started writing this in 2020, right? Yeah. It's 2024 and, and here is going to be landing uh, June 11. Yeah. Yeah. I Crazy. mean, that's just, that is exactly right. It's a, yeah. And it's, I'm sure if you compared the very first version of it to the version that's going to oh. be. <laughs> oh, I can't even, I can't even, it was, I just didn't know what I was doing, you know? Of course. Um, but, but you can still see, I haven't actually looked at it, but I know, I know that that inspiration is still there. Of course, I, I do know yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really about the kernel. There's that yeah. little kernel of the story, right? And that, mm -hmm. and if you're, you know, if it's the thing that, that you latch onto, then it's, it lasts, but the rest of it really, yeah. yeah, of course it changes. Of course it does. As a matter of fact, you know, at Kentucky Crystal, that woman that you said, yeah, she yeah. was originally going to be uh, one of the main characters wow. and Gemma and Gemma was just going to be like this little secondary character, but she was so much more interesting. I'd written mm -hmm. about six chapters where Kentucky Crystal was like the main person. And then Gemma had just kind of come on the scene and I was like, I like her so much more. She's so much more interesting that I just, um, you know, I changed that. Yeah. And that's a, actually, that's another thing, right? You have to be yeah. sort of willing to be like, to listen to the, when you're like, that's just a better option. You have to be willing yeah. to listen to that and know there's going to be work going back and removing yes. one character. Yeah. Yes. So it's, a, it's not a, yeah, it's a, but it's in that sense, it's sort of also like bodybuilding, right? You do yeah. the work, the repetitions, you get yeah. stronger, you get better, you get sharper, you get yeah. you are more aware of the right, you know, the right way to attack a scene or, I mean, yeah. it's, you know. I think a lot of things that are really, you know, worth doing are that way, but we don't have a lot of patience for it. I know I have, yeah, I have not got good patience and I'm, you know, it's 25 years. My first book came out in 2000. So wow. it's, um, yeah, okay. I'd like to say I'm getting patient, but I'm not sure yeah. I'm just getting older. <laughs> okay. So, okay. But yeah, but when I would get a little bit, um, I don't maybe frustrated isn't the right word, but the, there was like, there would be like parts in the middle of it where I'd be like, Oh my God, what am I doing? I would sometimes think, well, but now I've got like all these people like counting on me to like, you know, cause my agent has signed, like there's really like, there's, there's no giving up now. Right. The guy signs you, he's put in like hours and hours on this. So just yeah. suck it up and get it done. <laughs> yeah. Know? It's like any job it, at moments. Yeah. It's like any job. You're like, yeah. I don't want to be at this desk. I don't want to be doing this work, but you know, here I yeah. am. I have to do it. So yeah. this is so exciting. Are you working on Thank something you. new? I am. Um, we are in, uh, the manuscripts done. My agent and I have gone back and forth on it. it. It's with him right now. I sent it off to him last night again. It's not ready to go out yet, but it's, um, 
you know, I think in the next month or two, we might like to try to take it out if we think we can. It's, um, it's a book. I, I don't know if, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about it, but I'll tell you no, what. You can, what yeah, okay. Feel free. Okay. You I'll, I'll say, I'll, and... no, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you the okay. subject matter. Okay. So the, 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 this book that we were talking about bodies to die for, right. So it's about, you know, the war on women's bodies and, 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 um, you know, that we got to quit judging each other for what we do with our bodies. So the second book, um, is going to have two main characters, but one of them is going to be a software developer turned only fans creator. And so it's, it's, it's going to take a look at sex work, right? And a woman's right to do what she wants with her body. Um, uh -huh. So that's, that's, we're going to dive into that next. Um, I but, love uh, it. Yeah. I yeah, love yeah. it. Well, that is so exciting. So here we uh -huh. are. We've got bodies to die for Lori yeah. brand. We will have a copy of this book for giveaway. So follow us so on good. Facebook um, at Danielle's killer women, Lori. It was so yes. fun to talk to you today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being patient. I totally oh, messed bet. up the time with Lori. It's okay. I was, I'm, re I'm getting back from New York and my brain is still clearly on Eastern time. But anyway, this was fabulous, Lori. It was so yeah. fun to talk to you. I hope it sells a million copies and everyone. Me too. <laughs> thank you for joining us on Killer Women. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.